Well, it's, it's a labor of love. And so it's one of those things, if you're doing it just to cut costs, think of it more as a partnership and not starting a flying club because you're going to be quickly overwhelmed with this vision versus reality thing. We had a very specific vision that was enduring. And you look at our tagline, great planes, great people. And you look at our articulated values. It's easy because we lived it from day one, but it has to be built into the culture and it's not easy to do. Hello again, and thank you for joining us for episode 97 of the Aviation News Talk podcast. I'm your host, Max Truscott. And you just heard Mark Eppner, and in a few minutes, I'll be sitting down with Mark to talk about the Leading Edge Flying Club in Chicago, the importance of a club's culture, and his advice for how you can start a flying club. But first, if you're new to the show, we have a weekly news show that shares pilot safety tips and general aviation news from around the world. And if you enjoy this show, please click on the subscribe button on whatever app you're using to listen to the show today so that new episodes will download automatically to your phone each week. And after the show, if you find yourself wanting just a little extra aviation content, go on out to our Patreon site at aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome and click on the tab labeled post. There's also a link to it in the show notes. And if you feel that you get value from the show and you're in a position to help support the show by donating a few dollars each month, well, you can sign up to do that right there on the Patreon site. Again, that's at aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome. And now here's our conversation with Mark Epner. Now let me tell you a little bit about Mark Epner. Mark is a graduate of the University of Iowa, and he followed that up with an MBA at Lake Forest Graduate School of Management. And for over 30 years, he's worked in a variety of sales and sales management jobs, primarily in the software industry. And he's currently director of sales at Attunity. He first got his private license in 1976, but then took a 25-year hiatus. But he's been making up for lost time and now has about 1,900 hours He's the co-host of the Simple Flight Radio podcast, and in 2006, he founded the Leading Edge Flying Club at the Chicago Executive Airport. He's also given a couple of webinars for AOPA about flying clubs and helped write the AOPA Guide to Starting a Flying Club. Mark, welcome to Aviation News Talk podcast. Great to have you here. Oh, it's great to be here. I'm so excited. You know, you're kind of the standard by which I measure myself, so to be a guest on your show is the pinnacle of what I'm trying to achieve. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Mark, now I'm not going to believe anything you say. <laughs> Actually, it, was... it comes with complete sincerity, but uh, yeah, no, it's it's fun. I'm excited to be here, Max, and thanks for the opportunity. Well, uh, we have become good friends over a very short period of time, and you started talking about something a while back that I've been dying to talk with you about, and that is you were talking to me about the Flying Club Leading Edge that you talked about, and in our conversations, it, it really struck me that there was kind of something special and unique about that club compared to other flying clubs that I've heard about. So that's what I want to talk about today. It's from the beginning. Just tell me what prompted you to start Leading Edge. Well, and anytime we talk about starting a club, it would be probably in bad form for me to say me and I when it really was seven of us. What came about was we were learning or flying or renting. Each of us had a different reason for being at this flight school at Pelwaukee at that point, now Chicago Executive. And the owner was never there, so we all had key fobs. The place was dark, but they had really good aircraft. When I say good, I'm talking TAA. They had Garmin stacks, you know, GPSs. So it was something that kept us all coming back, but it was always to a dark hangar. We'd get a key fob, we'd pull it out, and then we started to run into each other and realize that, wow, we all share not only a similar passion for aviation, but the same types of things in aviation and wanted to talk to somebody about it. We needed our outlet. And so we started hanging out together and we went to the owner of the flight school and said, you could start a flying club. And he said to me in particular, there's no way people will pay $35 a month for the right to fly an airplane. And I said, no, it's much more than that. I put together a presentation that I showed him that he will actually increase revenue, increase his membership, membership being a new concept to him at that point, and that it would really work out well. He, he said no again. And so the seven of us went off and we found a glass panel, Piper Archer, at a, a flying club at an airport just north of here, Waukegan, Uniform Gulf November, but it was sitting because that club was made up of people that were 
looking to fly cheaply, and they were into older legacy Cessnas. And what we liked about this Piper Archer, it was glass avidine with the Garmin stack. It was a 2004, so really new. And we basically asked permission from that club president, do you mind if we steal that owner and that airplane as we started flying club at Pewaukee? And, and they felt bad that the Archer was not flying. And so we, we started it, came over, and the immediate word of mouth of what we were trying to do just spread like wildfire. So from those first seven people that built it because we needed a social outlet and a nice airplane to fly, we found there were a lot of people that were bitten by the same bug and has grown significantly since then. I think you just raised a, a key point right there, which is I think there are a lot of different purposes for flying clubs. And I know that as AOPA has talked about clubs in the past, one of the things they've talked about is uh, you know, a way to lower the cost of flying. And yet you've cited an example here where you know some people were interested in lower costs and others were interested in other kinds of things. Talk about the kinds of things that clubs can focus on and you know be successful at, even though they're, they're different. I think it's very common, and it's almost an assumption people make, that flying clubs are about lowering the cost of flying. In our case, it had nothing to do with that. It was all about the experience of a newer class of airplane, again, the glass, the GPS and all, and the driving force was we wanted to get together outside of just in the cockpit. And so this social piece was very, very strong in our culture. And we quickly understood that this was not uncommon in terms of need, but what was uncommon was a place to satisfy this need. Because so many clubs are, hey, why don't we get together, buy a cheap airplane and fly it at the, you know, the operating cost? We didn't care about that. Matter of fact, our rates were some of the highest in the area. But the membership that we drove, now numbering over 80 people, was all about the experience and the social. So I think it, I don't want to oversimplify it, but it kind of breaks down into those two areas, either this be able to fly more economically or to find fill some other gap that's missing in just going to the, the flight school or the rental organization at the end of the field. So let's come back to the social aspect a little bit later. I want to dig in a little bit to the kind of the structure of the club. You must have looked at a couple of different alternatives. And part of the reason I want to ask you about this is I'm sure there are people out there listening who are thinking, hmm, maybe I want to start a club someday. So what were some of the kind of options you looked at for structuring the club and what did you end up with? When you think of clubs, you, you have to answer all the the F's and the W's, where, what, how, you know, all of those kinds of things. And so one of the things that was a, an early on consideration is, is this an equity club or a non-equity club? To me, I just assumed non-equity was the way to go. And let me explain the difference. A non-equity club, the members do not own an airplane. A member may own an airplane, and that member may make it available to the other members, but only the owner or maybe an owner and a potential partner would actually have equity in the, the plane. Where very common in flying clubs is you buy in a share. Matter of fact, it's not uncommon to find clubs that may have three airplanes, 30 members, and your buy-in, your initial dues, pays for your share of equity across those airplanes. And then you pay your monthly, what well, relatively high amounts to for maintenance, insurance, all of that. And then you have your very inexpensive hourly rate. But with a non-equity club, the owner pays their own hangar, their own maintenance, their own insurance, although we get them better rates because of our buying power of having multiple airplanes. And we pay a retail rate like $175 an hour wet, for instance, for a Piper Archer. However, our annual dues are only $400. The initial buy-in is $90 rather than thousands of dollars. So it's kind of you pay me early or you pay me as you go. But there's so much less risk I saw in the non-equity model that that's what so six other members and I selected, and we've considered buying into some airplanes from point to point, and ultimately we're a non-equity. So I think when you talk about models, those are the first two things that 
come to mind? Or well, first, one thing is do you buy and share the ownership of an airplane across the membership or is it you make an airplane available across the membership and put that burden, if you will, of ownership, but also the profit, if there is such a thing in aviation, uh, on that one or two person partnership that makes it available back to the club. By the way, most people call that a lease back. It's, it's the wrong term, but we've been using it for years. It isn't actually a lease back, but that's what people are generally talking when we're in a non-equity operation. Yeah, and I would imagine the some of the advantages of that are that it allows you to start the club with less capital and probably grow it more readily. In other words, you don't have to keep going back to members and say, hey, we need another ten grand to buy another airplane. Exactly. As a matter of fact, the way it worked out for us, and if you think about 2006, 2007, as the club got into really bad economic times, there were many people that owned airplanes that really couldn't afford to fly them, and they were looking for a way to generate some revenue. And so in the beginning, we could flex our fleet, if you will, to say, you know what, we'd like to bring in a G1000 Diamond. Okay, here's a guy that's going to bring it in. We need a cross-country airplane. Let's bring in a Dakota uh, that can put four people in a PA-28 model uh, airframe and move at 140 knots right across the and again more of a cross country rather than a training airplane we had a a light sport type aircraft in the club so it gave us a lot of flexibility with the makeup of the fleet and allowed us also to grow or shrink the fleet as the membership did but with that you do lose some control of stability oh, we really like the Dakota. Oh, the owner picked up and moved to Florida and took his Dakota with him, right? So we no longer have that airplane. So there's some some pluses and minuses, but for us, the non-equity model provided us an opportunity to, you know, again, to, to kind of build that momentum, create the environment we were trying to create. And because we were focused not on the lowering of costs, but attracting a, a specific type of member, What's interesting is our club has translated to some 30 aircraft purchases that aren't available for rent, but my members go out. I have two members that own two airplanes each, and many of us have just gone off and bought our own airplanes, but we'd like to be members of the club because of the camaraderie. Saturdays, we hang around. Hey, I'm going to go flying. Someone want to sit right seat? Yeah, let's go. Let's go grab some breakfast. It's just the dynamic is, is so different. And exactly what we aim for, those whatever that is, gosh, is it 13, 14 years ago? Oh, my gosh. Time flies. (laughs) It does. And so do we, which is kind of fun. (laughs) You know, we're talking about uh, cost, and it made me think about a flying club uh, that I had uh, actually a couple of them when I think about it. Uh, years ago when I was a younger man and, you know, m- money was a little tighter, uh, I looked for the least expensive uh, flying clubs to join and didn't uh, bother me that I was flying uh, older aircraft now as I've gotten older and maybe uh, you know, more aware of my own mortality. I kind of like flying newer aircraft and ones that I think maybe are perhaps uh, more reliable. I think that's one of the trade-offs. You know, if people are looking for the the absolute uh, lowest cost, you know, they're going to end up with the uh, older, uh, you know, aircraft. Uh, now it sounds like your model really is you want better equipped aircraft. You said TAA, so that's uh, technically advanced aircraft, so things with the uh, GPS or moving map screens. Tell us specifically what's in your fleet now. Well, and let me, if, if you don't mind, Max, because you really hit a hot button you mentioned early on in the introduction that I took 25 years off. So picture me in the 70s when I was in my 20s. My risk profile was so different. Nothing was going to happen. I was immortal. And even then I was flying, quote unquote, late model aircraft. It was the 70s and the planes were built in the 70s. But when I got back into it in 2004, I was very aware of the danger of moving a body through the air at 200 miles an hour. And I remember talking to my wife saying, you know, it's costing me more at this one flight school, but I'm just more comfortable with newer, cleaner, appears to be right or wrong, better maintained just because it was newer newer and cleaner, right? There's a little bit of mental gymnastics going on there. And she would say, hey, fine, do that. So the risk profile was what drove us to not want to have 70s 
technology with duct tape on the seats and things like that. So today at Leading Edge Flying Club, we still have our Piper Archer, again, a 2004 Avidine Glass, perfect airplane to start a flying club. We've trained a lot of people in it and a lot of people that have taken it to some very, very cool places. In addition, we have uh, an older 2001, a G, or excuse me, a 2002 G1 SR20 with the steam gauges, which is weird. So our Archer is glass and the Cirrus is steam. It somehow doesn't compute. And then we have on a limited basis based on insurance requirements and the owner preference, 2011 SR22 G3 Turbo. And then again, I've got owners with Huskies, with 310s, with Bonanzas, with lots of Cirrus in our club, uh, Matrix. I got a guy that's just buying a Pilatus. But it's uh, it's just amazing. It's this passion for aviation and people not only leveraging the fleet in the club, but then their own airplanes. Well, you mentioned passion, and I saw that in some of your uh, presentations. For example, you've got uh, something called From Surviving to Thriving, which I thought was a great title. It was about effective club leadership. Tell me a little bit about you know, what you think is important as a leader of a flying club. Consistency and strict adherence to the culture and understanding that your stakeholders, most notably our members, our, fa our family, as I like to call them, is paramount in every decision, every action we take. So we're all about safety. We're all about late model aircraft. We're all about being advocates for general aviation. And so everything that we do as a, a board, because it's not just Mark Epner, I've got eight board members, our decisions, and we meet every month, are all about how do we reinvest back into the membership so that they get their their aviation goals achieved. So things like social events, whether it's what we call our dog day afternoons, you show up and we're going to cook hot dogs out on the ramp and just watch airplanes and talk about aviation. Our thank you barbecue in September, where we invite a hundred of our best buddies, which is the control tower, the line crew, family, friends that put up with our passion and feed them a really nice in the hangar meal, a holiday dinner at a, a very high end country club in January to celebrate what we do, our safety seminars. If there's a seminar coming to town, let's say the famous Max Trescott comes to Chicago, you can bet that our membership will start an email. Hey, Max is in town. Why don't some of us meet over for dinner and then go see Max? And we'll travel in groups of 10 or 20. The leadership of the club is very focused on creating those moments of truth, those events that support the mission, which ultimately supports our stakeholders, members, owners, and CFIs, even though we, we don't employ any CFIs. We have CFIs that can teach other members as uh, as individual contributors, uh, so or individual contractors. I'm sorry. So I, I don't know if that answers your question, but to me, it's about a very consistent decision-making body that meets on a regular basis to ensure we don't waver from the flight plan, if you will, that we put together back in 2006. So let's talk about the beginning. What are some of the kind of key things that you had to put in place to get started? Well, we had to find a home. We had to find an airplane. Again, remember, we had seven people that said we need more than what we're getting. And so we went around our own airport, Waukegan, other airports, just looking for flying clubs and seeing what was out there. We all had a sense that Pelwaukee, again, now called Chicago Executive Airport, was where we wanted to be home. It had a great vibe. It's very much a corporate high energy environment that had lost some of the GA or piston GA vibe that it had. And we saw it as an opportunity to be a driving force to bring it back to, well, essentially was the third busiest airport in Illinois behind O'Hare Midway. Once we decided on Pelwaukee, where are we going to reside within the airport? What hangar? How are we going to pay for it? How do we put a structure together? So all of these questions had not been answered, but needed to be answered before we could go. And we, and we 
I don't, I don't even know how it all came into being so fast, but we quickly found, found the archer up at Waukegan. We noticed that in one of the community hangars at Pelwaukee, there was a row of offices and they were all vacant grabbing dust. And so Signature Flight Support, who owns that hangar, we said, hey, we want to start a little flying club. Can we have one of these offices up on the catwalk, the catwalk that overlooks this community hangar? And so they gave it to us. We didn't ask them, but we actually cut a hole in the hangar and dropped in a picture window so we could out, see out into the ramp and put up a webcam. And from there, you know, we started to generate excitement. People started coming over. We eventually grew into a second bay of the, um, I guess bay is the right term. We exp- doubled our club size. And at that point, we had a little revenue so we could offer Signature a little bit of money. The place was still empty so they took what they what we could give them we have now grown into four i'm gonna keep calling them bays it sounds more for the airplanes but four sections so our clubhouse has gotten very large and a lot of other businesses have come in so now while we're paying more retail rates it was a partnership in the beginning where we were driving an energy of this piston ga vibe and signature just wrapped their arm around us and said, hey, let's go for the ride. Let's see what we can do together. And it's been very good for them. I have brought in several airplanes to their hangar, each paying uh, about $850 a month for a community hangar at uh, at Pelwaukee. Uh, but we're glad to pay it. They give great service uh, in the winter. They move the planes. They make sure they're stacked appropriately. They're good to us. You know, that sort of took care of itself. So we now had the airplane, we had the place, we established a budget because in the beginning it was just board members putting money in and buying stuff before we had any real revenue stream. But we believed in what we were building and again, it didn't take long before it came to fruition and we've only advertised once for members and that was a failure, but we have a constant flow of people that come over looking for more from the Piston GA piece, if you will, and we're the only ones that seem to provide it to them. Yeah, you talked about some of the important things for starting a club at the beginning, choosing the aircraft, finding a home, uh, budgeting. Uh, talk to us a little bit about insurance and also some of the club operations. How'd you come up with the rules? I'm sure you have some. Yes, we do. So again, I'm always keeping the customer, my family members, the member, if you will, in mind when decisions are made. So it has to fit. So insurance was relatively straightforward. We found an aviation broker and, and explained to him our vision. And he was able, as a broker, to bring us forward some insurance underwriters that were willing to take on what we were trying to do and gave us a fair rate. And then every year, by the way, we would present back to the broker our membership our uh, ratings, how many ATPs we had, CFIIs, how much training. And we would make a proposal back to the insurance company that says, you need to lower our rates because of look what we've done over the last year. And it, it just continued to work. We could get insurance on pretty much any aircraft with an appropriate risk and um, premium rating. And then we would just constantly, again, solidify that partnership through keeping them informed as to our growth and and um, what we were doing to improve the safety of the club. So rules, you know, at first we had a lot of people that already had their license, and so it was a lot of cross-country flying. We had a few airplanes, and then all of a sudden we started to pick up students, people that were going from their primary. So now instead of one or two day reservations, people were looking to have two hour blocks. And that became the genesis for a reservation policy that said, hey, you can only get so many reservations on in a time, for instance. And we answered all the questions that, that kind of came up and bit us over a very short time frame, but we reacted and built something that the membership always bought in. We also created rules around just decorum, rules about when you return the airplane, you will leave it better than you found it. There should not be a dirty airplane being picked up by the next renter unless you run into each other and you can work it out. When you're done and it's summer 
and there's bugs, clean the airplane. There should be nothing in terms of garbage or extra paper laying around the inside of the cockpit. Throw pre-flights and post-flights, you know, also answers a lot of questions. Um, how people pay, whether they pay by credit card or dollars. Where do they pay? Where do they send it? Where can they drop off checks? How much time? When do we invoice? All of these end up in a document which essentially are incorporated into a club handbook, and we created this, and before anyone joins the club, they have to read the handbook, and then we have an acknowledgement page that they understand it including the requirement to buy uh, renters or non-owned insurance on their own to cover deductible and any loss of use should they hurt one of the airplanes. So the rules are pretty all-encompassing. We looked at other clubs around. We kind of picked the best of the best. But it was really all of our rules came about because of necessity and need we saw within our own ranks based on situations that happened. And it, it was very friendly, and there really wasn't, We've only had one incident, which was a prop strike, which created any angst, but we got through it and made sure that the owner had no no out-of-pocket costs, and we even ferried him around to places he needed to go on our nickel during the time his airplane was being fixed. Yeah, I think uh, rules have to be written not just for the best of times, but also for those occasional incidents that, that occur as well. What What's your legal structure? What were you organized as? We are structured as a 501c7, a social club. And that was interesting. Our initial treasurer was, oh, it's going to cost us money to go 501c7. Let's just kind of operate as a a not-for-profit, but file taxes and all that. We didn't know much about 501c7. And actually, it was an AOPA webinar where once I got involved in putting on webinars, I talked to one of the AOPA people talking about those financial and tax structures. And I said, oh, my goodness, this this is what we do. Are we being idiots? And it turned out the answer was yes, we were being an idiot and that we were definitely a 501c7 organization and therefore should not have been paying taxes. And thankfully, we brought on a a good CPA that helped us through the process and we made a submission to the IRS and they said we could go back to the beginning and get a refund for any of the taxes, which our CPA said he had never seen anything like that before. But once again, I think whenever we deal with outside folks that are, treat us as a business partner, we're very professional, we're very thorough, and we make a case. And it, thankfully, in this case, it turned out that we were able to get all taxes back and operating going forward by meeting certain rules around number of meetings, our pure intent, our bylaws all support the concept of being a 501c7. Hmm. Now, tell me about the formal leadership roles that you have in the in the organization. Well, as you would expect, you know, you have president, vice president, secretary, and treasurer, and then board members. But the the functional roles on top of that, like a social director, uh, I, we really don't have that kind of title, director or chairperson or whatever. But the social guy, right? You know, he says, let's put together a flat. We go to him. We do a dog day afternoon. He controls it. And controlling it doesn't mean he does all the work. It means he asks for the volunteers. We need someone to show up at this time to do this and that. So social is very important. A webmaster, a communications person is important because we get Facebook postings and and just even to our website to keep track of inquiries that come in. And then the, the the four officers to ensure that we don't skip a beat. You know, every month I have a board meeting and we have our nine members show up. I mean, it's just like running a business. And I think that's what changed early on for us. We stopped just having quote unquote fun and running by the seat of our pants. We understood this was a business and that there was financial risk. So we put guidelines in as a leadership organization to say, if we don't fly a single airplane, this club needs to survive. Does our budget support that? And it was these operating guidelines that the board puts in place and monitors on a monthly basis is key to moving from just surviving to thriving. I would really like some of the notes you have in here about teamwork. One of my favorite ones that I don't think I've read before was, everyone must get along all the time. <laughs> I like that. Tell me about teamwork in the organization. 
Oh, wow. I, now, I, now I know which one you're looking at. You know, that's something that I use in business as well. I've, I've been afforded the opportunity to run some pretty nice sized uh, organizations in the software world. And, and, you know, you mentioned something about you, the paperwork or the, the rules for the good times and the bad. I've always said it's it's really easy to be a good teammate, a good partner, a good spouse, a, a good business partner when things go well. The true test is when things aren't going well, right? It, it, matter of fact, I, I have a, when someone says, how come you've been married or how have you been married for 41 years? I say two tubes of toothpaste. She squeezes in the middle. I squeeze in the bottom. It's not worth fighting about. We each get our own tube, right? So there's these simple rules to get through the partnership challenges and and to to make sure that kind of we all move forward. So in teamwork, a, a good performing team is all about understanding the ultimate goal. It's not about, hey, we're good friends. I know you disagree, so I'm going to agree with you. No, you have to challenge respectfully. I also say in those kind of presentations that all opinions are not equal. I, I break opinions into two. There's the informed opinion and there's the hypothesis. Many times people come in with an hypothesis. To me, that does not have as much value as an informed opinion. So if someone comes in and has a good basis for understanding and a, for presenting their view, I'm going to give that more weight. And that's okay, because ultimately all of us want the same thing, and that's to get to the end result that supports the mission of the club, of the business, whatever it is, of the partnership. And so as long as we stay focused on that and understand that we don't have to get along all the time, we just have to have trust as the cornerstone of the of the family, and that we understand not all opinions are created equal. I like that. It's not a true democracy. <laughs> well, no, but it, you know, it works because we all want the same thing. When we join the club, it's, it's not about flying cheaper. It is about more flying enjoyment, an outlet for our passion, a de-stressor. You know, I always say flying is my yoga because my wife likes yoga to de-stress. We all share that. We're a community. The word community is really two root words, common unity. And no matter where I go, whether a person's a pilot or not, if they're an aviation enthusiast, an av geek, I know philosophically we're aligned and we're going to share this this passion, this need to be involved with aviation. And so as long as we keep that in mind, it's amazing the contention you can get through, the disagreements, because ultimately we want the same thing. And it, it, it works. I <clears throat> We don't get mad at each other ever, but we do disagree with a lot with each other. So you also talked about informal roles, cheerleader, optimist, visionary. I'm sure those are a lot more important than most people think. How does that play out in the club? So, you know, they do. And thank you for even reminding me about that. What's great about this is you're going back to an older webinar. And I, one of the dangers I've always said about existing leadership staying in place is Putting the place on autopilot, it's very bad, and I, I catch myself doing it all the time because life got in the way. But I'm reminded of situations we had, in one case, a member that was breaking club rules. And everyone wanted the member out. This member had been, quote-unquote, fired, if you will, from flight school, so they, they had a history. But I could depend on one of my board members to be our conscience. He w would talk about the good pieces of what this member brought to the, the table. And while there were discrepancies and things that needed to be addressed, it wasn't a binary out of the club, in the club. Maybe there were things that we could do in the interim. And it's that kind of leadership and, again, not just agreeing all the time to say, guys, we are a club that's looking for people that love aviation. This member has gone astray, but they still love aviation. Their heart's in the right place. What can we do to retain this person? And then ultimately, and we don't have to get into it, but ultimately we took away flying privileges for a while because we felt we didn't want any risk associated with hurting this person or anyone that was around him if, if their decision-making wasn't what we considered safe. 
but didn't mean that the person couldn't come to social events and and be a, a, a thriving member of the club. So it's those informal roles because certainly we don't have, oh, you're the conscience, you're the, you know, I've forgotten now because it has been so many years, some of those other roles, but that oversight, that common sense, when you look at it as a family member, you say, hey, we're missing the boat here. We did the wrong thing there. That's not going to come with any formal structure. That's going to come from people applying their personality, their values to the under, underlying culture. I notice here that you do surveys, and the club that I teach most for also does uh, annual surveys. What uh, have you learned from your surveys, and how do you find them important in the in the process? Well, the initial surveys were around what kind of airplanes you want. I, at one point, we had a member that wanted to buy a fun airplane. I want to bring in a tail dragger. I want to do this. And I said, okay, well, let's do a survey. And the feedback we got from the membership was, well, that's all well and good, but we're not going to fly it. We want a 300 horsepower cross-country airplane. So the owner or the member who was willing to invest said, okay, and he ended up buying an SR-22 for the club uh, at that point. Uh, Because, again, you listen to the membership. But the other surveys I found, while we have done more formal computer-based surveys looking for how are we tracking, what, what are we doing right, what are we doing wrong, I've found that I get more from just the daily interaction of talking to club members all the time. And, and again, I'll call it the informal survey, and all of our members and all of our board members have this necessity, if you will, to talk aviation. So it, it's not like the opportunities don't present. But in the spirit of two eyes, two ears, and one mouth, you have to be listening and looking when you're talking to someone truly engaged to hear what they're saying, that there is maybe a gap from from vision and reality. We probably have gotten away from it, a little bit of that autopilot of doing the more formal stuff, but I feel really good that informally we're in real close touch with the membership. And again, the only reason we exist is because of the membership. Well, you started talking about social events earlier, and I wanted to circle back around it. And I had to laugh because the first thing you mentioned was hot dogs. And my family knows that I will occasionally sneak out to Costco to get a hot dog. Um, <laughs> <laughs> must be that pilots like food. Talk about the role of social events and in a little more detail about the kinds of things you do. Well, and I'm going to go back to the very beginning of our discussion here is this club was born out of a need for social activity. We all could fly, and we were flying airplanes we loved, but we didn't have that connection to other people that shared our passion. So that ultimately drove this club and and is very much manifests itself in all that we do. So I talk about the dog day afternoons. We have monthly breakfast, which, yeah, it, it just we all love to eat, right? Flying, food, and fun, and family. You can just call it the four Fs. And so... Even yesterday, Saturday, February 2nd, was a very light turnout for our, uh, for breakfast. But we had 20 people show up. I feed them breakfast at a very nice hotel. If it's warm enough, we'll put it in the hangar. And then we start talking about safety and ADM, aeronautical decision making, and the fact that we had had this cold blast. I had been ill. I hadn't flown for two weeks. Now I was going to fly somewhere and all of a sudden, I had this anxiety in me that says, Mark, you usually fly multiple times a week. You haven't flown in two weeks. Can you go? Yet the guy next to me flies every three months. And if he went two weeks, he'd feel very comfortable. So we started talking about what drives that anxiety level that we feel inside us sometimes when we get airplane in an airplane. And should we heat it? And what do we do about it? And I had a, a 777 captain, DPE at this at this breakfast, a member of our club, uh, another gentleman that flies for the regionals. I got guys like me that sell software during the week, but we all have very valid opinions. I have, a matter of fact, a flight instructor. It's been instructing for over 50 years, never flown for the airlines, uh, was there. And to hear everyone's perspective. And in the end, we decided how important it is for all of us to extend our decision space, extend our utility of the airplane, not by being unsafe, 
but by going with others, whether it's a CFI or not, that are comfortable in that space and to be able to understand what are our outs. Those are what we get from our social interactions, whether it's a safety breakfast meeting, it's a training event on a Tuesday night where we bring everybody in and we talk about a specific topic, if it's a dog day afternoon, if it's, uh, hey, there's Max Trescott in town, let's go have dinner, and over dinner we'll talk about this stuff. It's a mixture of formal and informal opportunities for us to interact under the guise of social interaction. All right. So what advice would you give to someone who's starting a flying club? Well, it's it's a labor of love. And so it's one of those things, if you're doing it just to cut costs, think of it more as a partnership and not starting a flying club because you're going to be quickly overwhelmed with this vision versus reality thing. We had a very specific vision that was enduring. And you look at our tagline, great planes, great people. And you look at our, our articulated values. It's something, it's easy because we lived it from day one, but it has to be built into the culture. And it's not easy to do. If you're doing this as a volunteer, you know, it's a, a labor of love, as I, as I already stated. You really need to understand that it's going to be more than you. You probably need a good five people to share the load and a multi-year commitment to to staying with it. And the the fun and the shiny object status will wear off potentially, although here I am all these years later and I don't feel any less passion for the club or what we do. But life is going to get in the way and you've got to figure out how to get by it. So it's Understand the questions, use the resources. AOPA has some great resources, including the book that I help write. They've got webinars. They've got people there at the end of the phone that can help. I've spoken at Sun and Fun. I've spoken at Oshkosh. People call me still to this day asking my advice. I'm very happy to take calls and, and take people through kind of the decisions and the discussion topics that need to happen. But uh, use the resources out there. If you're planning to do it on your own, you're going to fail is my ultimate uh, prognostication. <laughs> well, I'm curious. Are there things that you now know that you kind of wish you had known when you started the club? Well, there was some financial structure. We were we felt like we were kind of running a Ponzi scheme, that we went with monthly dues, and we are always trying to collect this month's dues to pay our bills from last month. And it was just one member say, why don't you just give us, ask us to give you dues on an annual basis and build it and we'll draw from it. It was the easiest and silliest thing. And we didn't do that for two or three years. It turned the club around from, you know, hand to mouth each month to now having actually too large of a reserve. We have bought Sims for the club. We have bought headsets for the club. We've remodeled our club. I invest in outside scholarships. I mean, it, it's put us in a position to do a lot of things. So understanding the financial flows and how to, like in this case, starting with annual dues, really turned us around. Everything else is really not that many surprises. The thing that I probably failed on most is when I wrote the From Surviving to Thriving, it was all about succession planning. And finding people who have the time and the the vision to carry on what we do here has been tough. And that's why I said sometimes I find we've gone on autopilot, which I hate, but I mean, I, I got other parts of my life. I've got eight wonderful board members that are my teammates and I can depend on. They're there every month for me and me for them. But <clears throat> I think that's the most critical factor is thinking through. And we have uh, every year we replace half the board, or at least we have votes, but it seems to be the same people all the time. And that's scary to me. I think that's the, if you look back, we got to ensure and encourage fresh board members all the time, not because someone moved away and we were forced into it, getting people to raise their hand, getting them voted in and get a new look on decisions and also ensure that youthful energy that young energy, I don't know if it's youthful, I'm pretty old, but uh, the energy that comes with having new ideas to an organization, I think, is the most critical piece. 
You mentioned scholarships. I know a lot of clubs do scholarships that will help people uh, with the cost of learning to fly, but that's not what you've been doing. Tell us about what you are doing with scholarships. Well, what we did do, and we need to go back to it, there's a couple things. So the most important thing is we had members and we started something we called ground effect advisors. And we said, all these scholarships are going to produce one pilot. We built a flying club that's producing multiple pilots. Why wouldn't we create a scholarship to start a flying club that can start, if you will, or generate the next generation of pilots? It was actually a member, um, Lou Bowers, I I want to give him proper credit, that came up with that idea. So a few of us got together as part of the flying club, and we went to AOPA and said, would you contribute $1,000, $1,000, went to David Clark, would you contribute headsets? We went to the TimeSync people, would you contribute Schedule Master Online Scheduling? And we just went down the list and we put together the perfect doggy bag, if you will, for starting a flying club. And everyone said yes. And then we put out this questionnaire and we received, I think it was 128 applications for earning the right. And we had some wonderful discussions among ourselves as to who to pick, but there was one that would just stood out for me, and I'm I'm upset with myself because um, I've I've forgotten his name, but Cape Fear Flyers in North Carolina. Oh, Max, this is embarrassing because I, he and I got really close, but he was a winner, and he did everything that we told him to do, and he built a leading edge flying club, right? And it was, and they've grown since then. He's financially invested in it. And to me, that was the perfect winner. We gave the other 127 clubs to AOPA to say, can you help these people? We helped another one, although they ended up being very much focused on give us our money and, and uh, we want to start something. They didn't really have the, the structure and the, the motivation behind them, and I knew that one would probably struggle. But all these go people go in with good intentions, and all are based on a passion for aviation. So to me, that was the great way to, to go at it. We tried to recreate that a second year in a row. AOPA said they would help, but they had some leadership changes. We had some changes, and so it didn't continue as, in that form. But what has continued is our investment outside of our club. We sponsor a Run the Runway event where we bring runners to the airport to generate new interest in the airport and people that have, you know, potentially that spark that you and I have and all of us pilots have, that they'll come to the airport and they'll run a 5K and they'll walk away saying, I could learn how to fly. This is pretty cool and generate interest. I speak at rotary events. I speak at other club events. I've tried to start flying clubs, if you will, at the high school, although I've run into some pushback from the the high schools. I don't understand it. We do things like we see someone in the observation area with a father and wife and two kids, fingers wrapped around the chain link fence, watching people take off and to stop by and have a conversation with them. And I have even one example where I said, you guys like to sit inside an airplane? Oh, my goodness, I thought their eyes were gone. I said, follow me, right? And you grab them from the fence, and you you bring them into behind the fence, if you will. And I remember looking in the car behind me in my rearview mirror as I'm coming through the gate and seeing the family, the eyes wide. They were getting to be on the other side and putting those kids in my airplane and thinking, you know what, I might have just generated two two new pilots today, right? Because that's what we need to do is just that incremental effort to bring people into general aviation. And it's so much fun because we love to talk about what we do. And now here's a willing audience. It's the people that don't know what we do and don't get to see the inside of the fence. So we have opportunities to reach out to the community. And that's actually in our club a value statement about being empowered to be an advocate for general aviation to the outside community. 
I really love that you're uh, bringing people and sticking them in the airplane. I think there's an unwritten rule in aviation, which is that we always have to wave at the kids, you know, anytime you see them. Uh, <laughs> so when I'm at the San Carlos airport, uh, the taxiway takes me right next to the Hiller Museum and they've got a viewing platform and often it's got kids all over it. So anytime I'm taxiing back, and of course I'm in the, the right seat, someone else is doing the taxiing, but I open the door and I just wave furiously and you would not believe the reaction. They just love it. I, I do believe it because I see it. And, you know, we as pilots love the $100 hamburger, which has got to be like an $800 turkey sandwich these days. But when I go to the local restaurant and you see the folks that drive in in the local community, fingerprints on the on the uh, window of the restaurant, these kids, I just go in there and I sit down and I say, hey, do you, if you want, I'd be happy to put your your son or daughter in my airplane. Of course, the parents want to come out too. Would you really? So, you know, you look for opportunities to bring, again, someone that's in our airport restaurant. Bring them out to the airplane. Don't just wave at them. Let them hold on to the yoke. Mom, Dad, take a picture of them. We, we have a tremendous opportunity to do what, at least when I was young, there was no fences, of course, but we could just go over there and, and talk to pilots and be more a part of that community. I don't see that as much, yet we have every bit of the opportunity because we interact in any of these trips we take with people on the other side of that airport door. Well, I'm hoping there's someone out there listening somewhere in the world right now who's thinking, hmm, maybe I really should start a flying club. What kind of resources are available to people if they want to start doing this now? Well, there's so many clubs out there. And again, I think it, it starts with understanding what you want to build. But I, my first step would absolutely go to AOPA. They've got some wonderful resources on starting a flying club. They've got, um, I'm not sure the the uh, gentleman's name that runs it now, but someone to talk to on the phone. They've got the guide. It will take you through the questions you should be asking and how to research the answers. And then talk to people that have started a club, good or bad, they're going to have experience and you can learn from that. And it, every year it's different, right? In 2006, 7, and 8 with the economy it sucked as it did, it was a very different world. Aviation seems to be much more booming now, but there is still this need. Why am I, I'm going through unprecedented growth at our club. We almost have to limit it because people are interested to be part of the brotherhood or the sisterhood or fraternity sorority. I, I want to be gender neutral here in this, but, but uh, you know, there's this connection between us. I used the word before community, and it just seems to me that that still needs its outlet, and a flying club is the perfect way to do it. And so it's getting out there and talking to the people. Well, you talked about community, and I think you're all about building community. You're doing that with uh, Simple Flight Radio. Tell folks about that. So Simple Flight Radio, it was an interesting time in my life. Um, I had had a, a very successful 11-year career at a company that was coming to a close just through some unfortunate circumstances, if you will, through a leadership change. And what I turned to was aviation, right? It, it was, again, I, I'd say it today, it's my yoga, it's my de-stressor. And Al Waterloo, who was flying a King Air at that point for a bakery company, called me and he said, hey, um, I started this podcast at Oshkosh last week, and it was, um, I guess, 2012. Uh, it was July 2012. And he said, August 1st, I'm looking for someone that you want to co-host with me. And I said, August 1st happens to be my first day of unemployment. And I had another job lined up, but it was three months away and I was going to take an aviation sabbatical. And I said, you know what, this is the perfect way for me to kick off my aviation sabbatical. And so we did a show and I thought it was like the best thing since sliced bread. I go back and listen to it now and it actually, technically it sucked, but, but we were all about positive vibes in GA that there was so much to be proud of and, and optimistic about and people seem to be talking down to aviation. So that with that show, you know, Al said, you want to come back next week? I said, absolutely. And it's kicked off, right? We're in our seventh season. He had to take off a couple years for, for a job thing. We were live for the first five, six years. And one of the benefits 
of moving from a live show to a recorded show, while we lost some spontaneity, if you will, was the ability for Al and I to take a much more professional look at the show and recognize that we had in Joby Benoit a professional technical producer who could really help us put some great touches to the show, which has really translated to a better connection to our audience. And I learned so much, and I felt like there was such a good energy in working with Al. And for a while, we had Rhonda Kabir, who um, has since taken a job in Hawaii. Good for her. And so, but she stood in for Al while he had taken his leave. That to me, it was all about finding the people that are making a difference in aviation and then helping our listeners kind of discover their av geek is kind of our tagline now because people listen and and we the comments and the loyalty we get from people it's just awesome so evidently we've we've hit a chord and again 7 years into it we're uh, we're still going strong and it's uh it's the highlight of my week Yes, and I listen to Simple Flight every week, so it's you're doing a fantastic job there. Now, let me just kind of talk about how it, perhaps aviation has changed a little bit. You and I are both, you know, getting up there in years a little bit, but you know, we've been in the game for years and years and years. It wasn't uh, necessarily, uh, you know, something that was affordable and easy as for us when we were young, but you know, we certainly found ways to do it. What advice would you give to someone out there who's listening who has the dream, who says, "Oh man, I just got to learn to fly." but you know, doesn't quite see a path yet to, to do that financially? That's a, a great question, Max. And I, I think about that often. You know, the world has changed. I mentioned in the early days there were no fences. You go back in the 70s, I would wash airplanes at the local FBO in exchange for flight time. I aligned with the sales guy that was selling aircraft of all types. I told him if I could wash the airplanes and prep them for him, could he teach me the business? He would let me, once I got my private pilot license, he would let me uh, fly the airplane to the new owner and then bring him back. I mean, it was just a bartering system. I don't know that that exists. But what does exist is this camaraderie talked about today with the flying club, for instance. I think I mentioned it. If I didn't, it was a mistake on my part in that when I go on Saturdays just to hang I don't want to go up flying by myself. There's an opportunity. We had a young man that came to our flying club breakfast yesterday. As my guest, I always invite, hey, if you're interested in flying, I'm going to buy you breakfast. Just come and meet the membership. He came over after breakfast, and there was like six or eight of us hanging around, just hanging or flying. It's IFR out. He's only been on one discovery flight. And I think, you know what? This is a great opportunity for me to to go get a couple of approaches in because it's IFR. And I said to him, do you want to come with? You won't be able to see much, but we can go for a flight. You can see what IFR flight's like. Absolutely. And then I, another guy that's a, a private pilot candidate, it's only taken a couple lessons. Do you want to come too? So I put you know two people that weren't pilots into my airplane, and I went and shot a couple of approaches. It was very safe. There was no ice, you know, all of that made sure they were comfortable. So those opportunities, I believe, exist. And that's going to come from hanging around the airport. Nothing frustrates me more than to read in the paper, which I've seen about people that say their dream is to fly, but they can't afford it, so their dream will have to be put on hold forever, potentially. No, it's your dream. Find a way. And it's If you can just find through a local flying club or a flight school, even if you can't afford to fly, if you can start hanging around, I bet you there are pilots that you can start to befriend that will, again, they're they're not looking just to take you up, but if they're going up, maybe you buy them lunch and they'll fly you there. There's got to be ways to do it, and it's not going to be achieved by sitting on a sim in your house. Get over to the airport, meet with people. And if you need help doing that, give me a call. I don't care where you're at. I can find someone at any airport in the country, I'm sure, that'll help you get up there. Your passion for aviation is just unparalleled, Mark. I wish everyone running a flying club or as a pilot had had your passion and reached out in the way that you do and in so many different ways. Let's talk about where people can find out more about uh, Leading Edge and also about uh, Simple Flight Radio. 
Great. Yeah, leadingedgeflyingclub.com. That's simple. You'll notice, I think the best sense for that, because we don't do the greatest job in keeping it up to uh, date, if you will, you go over to the far right side on the pull-down menu and look at webcams. We have a ramp cam and one in our community hangar, that one I talked about earlier, and we use it all the time. Matter of fact, while you're looking, you might see it move around because people are controlling it. That's where I would go, and you get a sense for, look at all those airplanes in that hangar, not just leading edges, but some of those are our airplanes. And you can learn more about the club. Click on Contact Us, and I'll get an email, and I can return it. There's also a phone number that will ring right to my cell phone at leadingedgeflyingclub.com. Regarding Simple Flight, it would be uh, simpleflight.net, www.simpleflight.net. We'll take you to the home page of our web page. The podcast is at simpleflight.net slash podcast. And you can follow us at Simple Flight Radio, uh, Facebook, Facebook, <laughs> Facebook, Instagram, and Simple Flight Radio for Twitter. So all over the social media. And again, just reach out to me. I'm happy to connect you in any part of my aviation life and would love to get a chance to meet some of the, the Max Trescott followers because it's, it's a gap in my goal, Max. I got to meet more people that you know. <laughs> Mark, I'm surprised that you don't already know everyone in aviation. <laughs> I, it's not, not my goal, but I love all pilots, so it wouldn't be a bad thing. That's great. Well, thank you so much for everything that you do for general aviation and for talking with us here today. And Max, my pleasure. And thanks to you as well. This is, I, I love your show and what a terrific opportunity to spend some time with you today. Well, you can really sense Mark's passion for aviation. And what I really like is how he channels that passion into actually doing things to help other people pursue their passion for flying. Hopefully, you'll pick up a few good ideas from him that you can use. I really like the idea of a Run the Runway event. And when I went to look that up, I discovered one of my local airports, San Carlos, actually holds an event like that in April each year. Now, I've also included links in our show notes to things like the AOPA How to Start a Flying Club document that Mark mentioned. And I'll also upload that document to our dedicated Aviation News Talk app under the PDF tab so that you can also find it there. And if you're interested in buying any model of Cirrus aircraft or jet or interested in flight training, please contact me now for a free consultation. In some cases, I can arrange a free demo flight for you. And I'm always just happy to talk with you about the ins and outs of buying new versus used. The call is free. Just give me a ring, 650-967-2500, or go out to aviationnewstalk.com and click on Contact at the top of the website. I specialize in the Cirrus and work with people around the world. Also, please check out our Patreon site and consider becoming a supporter of the show. Now, I always try to add a few new supporters every month because we lose a few supporters each month when people either don't update their credit card or they drop out because of changes in their finances. So if you find value in the show, and I'm guessing if you've been listening for an hour, you'll probably find some value in the show. Please sign up to donate a few dollars each month via credit card by going out to our Patreon site at aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome. And finally, Please take a moment to show your aviation friends how they can get the Aviation News Talk podcast. That way they can listen every week just as you're doing. And if they don't know what a podcast is, and most people don't, just send them to the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store if they use Android to download our dedicated Aviation News Talk podcast app. You just go search for Aviation News Talk, three words in the App Store. And by the way, you probably already know those apps are free. So until next time, fly safely. Have fun and keep the blue side up.